assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For, it, for by it the people of old received their commendation. By faith the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. Thank you, Lord, for granting us the opportunity to come before you today, to worship as a community, to be in your presence, Lord. You are truly worthy to be praised. And I ask now, Lord, that you open our hearts and our minds so that we can hear the message from you and give us the wisdom and discernment on how to apply this message to our lives. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your mercy. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Now, the last time I had the privilege of preaching, I share with you my story about making a decision to leave my secure job because staying, I believe, was not aligned with the purpose that God had for my life. Immediately upon leaving, I was faced with a global pandemic and like all of you, pushed into a period of waiting. With the uncertainty of when I would ever work again, I knew I was in for a long waiting period, and I decided to figure out how to wait well. I shared the four things that I learned about how to wait well, and to give you a very high, high level recap, I learned you wait well by worshiping God, by praying, by being courageous, and by having patience. All four of these things take practice when applied. You are able to grow your relationship with God. I learned so much from my experience of waiting in 2020 that really helped me and continues to bless me. Now on the surface, these four elements to waiting probably seem easy enough, but waiting isn't easy, is it? Waiting can be hard and waiting well can be even harder. Waiting can make us feel anxious, frustrated, and even doubtful. Waiting challenges your patience because your instinct is to want to rush through it and have the wait be over. Waiting can challenge your faith and your perseverance. And what if your period of waiting is triggered by a bad decision you made, or it's because of a personal weakness, or due to not fully walking in obedience to God? Maybe you have made choices that have left you feeling shame, regret, and condemnation. How do you wait well when you don't know where you stand with God? How do you wait well when you don't feel worthy? You see, I found myself in that very situation where a personal weakness led to a period of waiting. A period of waiting that would need God's grace and mercy. Everything that I previously learned about waiting well didn't seem to be enough, and I even questioned if God would in fact help me. I realized with these doubts that God had more to show me about how to wait well, and I think the story of Rahab gives us a perfect example of how to wait well even when your past choices have not been obedient to God's will. How, in fact, God's promises are always true and that he will use even our shortcomings and failures in a way that will bring about good. Now, Rahab is listed as one of the ancients in the Hebrews Hall of Fame, and you can find her full story in the book of Joshua, starting in chapter 2. That's where we meet Rahab, and it's a pivotal point in the Israelites' journey to the Promised Land. They are on the verge of entering the promised land after spending 40 years wandering in the wilderness. Moses had just died and Joshua was now at the helm and it was his turn to send the spies into the land. The last time the spies were sent into Canaan, the land that God had promised Abraham, it was Moses who was sending them. And he had eight of the 10 spies come back and they were filled with so much fear based on what they saw, they figured there was no way that they could claim the promised land. And this was despite the counter argument and faith of two of the 10 spies, Joshua and Caleb. 
Fear spread through the camp of Israel like wildfire. The Israelites forgot all that God had done, all the miracles that they had experienced. The parting of the Red Sea when they left Egypt and the numerous battles that they won. The Israelites even wished that God had left them to die in Egypt. This lack of faith led to God's decision to let the Israelites wander for 40 years. Another 40 years of waiting. But now here they are 40 years later and Joshua has charged two spies with scouting Jericho. Now Jericho was an idolatrous, intimidating fortress. The two spies set out on their mission and the scripture says that they came to the house of Rahab, a prostitute, and stayed there the night. Now, I had to do a double take when reading Joshua chapter 2 because I realized that Rahab's house was not the second or the third stop on their journey. It says her house was the first place that they went to, a prostitute's house. Now, many Christians try to whitewash Rahab's story, relabeling her as an innkeeper versus a prostitute. But the New Testament, New Testament is very clear. Our text of emphasis, which was taken from Hebrews, refers to Rahab as a prostitute. It also, in James 2, verse 25, it refers to her as a prostitute. Now, I believe that God sent these spies to Rahab. He didn't wait until she had cleaned up her act. God sent them to her even while she was still living a sinful life. He sent them to her in the midst of her sin and shame because God had a plan for Rahab's life. Rahab being a prostitute would have had many men coming and going from her house. I'm sure all types of people. I don't know how much she paid attention to each person, but what I do know based on the scriptures is that she knew she had two Israelite spies in her house. She was now faced with a choice. She could turn them in or she could keep quiet. She in fact chose to hide the spies on her roof. She wouldn't turn them in even when demanded by the king of Jericho to do so. Instead, she lied and said that they had left the city. She actually sent the soldiers on a wild goose chase. Once the soldiers were gone, she used the opportunity to speak to the spies and what she shared was so vulnerable. In Joshua chapter two, verse nine, she said, I know the Lord has given this land to you. We are all afraid. Everyone in the land is living in terror. And then she went on to justify their fear by recounting all the stories she had heard of God's miraculous deliverance of the Israelites, from the parting of the Red Sea to the victorious battles against the two kings east of the Jordan River. Then she tells the spies in verse 11, no wonder our hearts are melted in fear. No one has the courage to fight after hearing these things. After all she had heard and the fear that, in, at, that it had invoked, Rahab concluded one thing. She declared, for the Lord your God is the supreme God of the heavens above and the earth below. Now what a different response Rahab had to hearing the mighty acts of God. Even the Israelites themselves who had experienced these miracles at one point turned their hearts from God and let fear take over. And that's what led them to wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. What a different response that Rahab had from the other people in the city of Jericho. Rahab too realized that she was on the losing side, but she had a choice. She chose faith in God and that by surrendering to the one true God and changing her allegiance, that she would be saved. But would this really be possible? After all, she was a prostitute. Why would the Israelites want to help her? Well, you know, Rahab, she was shrewd and she had an idea. She had an idea of how to get the Israelites to help her. 
she decided to ask the spies to swear to her that they would be kind to her and her family since she was kind to them and helped them. She asked for a guarantee that when they conquered Jericho, that they would let her and her entire family, including her father, her mother, her brothers, her sisters, and all of their entire families live. Now the spies agreed, but with conditions. I think it was smart that they actually had conditions. Now the first is that she couldn't betray them. The second is that she and her relatives had to be in their home and not go outside during the fighting. And the third is that she had to leave a scarlet rope hanging from her window. Rahab accepted their terms, leaving the scarlet rope hanging from the window and sent them on their way, instructing the spies to wait and hide in the hill country for three days. Now, I can only imagine how Rahab must have felt after the spies left. It was nighttime when they left. Did she even sleep that night? Did she wait until morning before going to speak to all of her relatives in, in an attempt to save their lives? While the entire city was stricken with fear as they were waiting for the Israelites to make a move, Rahab, with only a few facts about God, had decided to choose faith. Faith that God would not only spare her life, but the lives of all of her relatives. Rahab probably thought that she had three days to convince her family that God was the supreme God and that they should seek his protection. She had three days to convince them to be obedient and follow the agreement that she had made with the Israelite spies. Here she was a prostitute, convincing her family that she had the path to being saved. I can imagine the doubts that could have entered her mind. What if they don't believe me? What if the king finds out? What if the Israelites don't honor their promise to me, a prostitute? Now, what Rahab didn't know is that she would be waiting way longer than three days for the Israelites to take Jericho. Once the spies finished their three days of hiding in the hill country, they made their way back to the Israelite camp. They told Joshua everything that had happened, and unlike the spies who had returned when, Joseph, uh, when Moses sent spies into the land, these spies had a unified and, and a clear message for Joshua and their fellow Israelites. They said, the Lord has surely given the whole land into our hands. All the people are melting in fear because of us. Now, what a stark difference to when Moses asked his spies to give a report. All because Rahab chose to be vulnerable and share how she and all of Jericho were feeling. Now the stage was set for a miracle. Imagine how ready and pumped up the Israelites were to charge ahead and take the city of Jericho. But God had other plans, and there would be more waiting time, not just for the Israelites, but for Rahab. God's plans included the Israelites making a day trip to the bank of the Jordan River, a three-day rest, a miracle parting of the Jordan River, a Passover celebration to remember how God had delivered the Israelites from Egypt, there was even a circumcision thrown in there for all the Israelite males. And if that was not enough, they spent not one day circling the wall of Jericho. They circled it for a total of six days, once around the city walls, right? And then back to the camp without a peep from anyone. Now, with all those days of waiting for Rahab with a house full of people, I can only imagine what the wait must have been like. All the people she had to take care of, to feed, the fears of all that she had to calm. Not to mention her own unanswered questions. Rahab didn't have the knowledge and understanding of God as we have it today. She did not have the benefit of having the Bible or even knowing about Jesus. She did not have a community of believers as we do today. 
Yet as she waited, she stayed true to her covenant with the Israelite spies and remained in her home with her entire family while the Israelites circled the wall on that last day. She put her faith in God even though she did not know what the outcome would be. I can only imagine Rahab and her family looking down from Rahab's home on the city wall as the Israelites circled the wall not one time like they had these last six days. This time, they circled the wall six times without a sound. And after they circled the wall the seventh time, Joshua gave the command. He told the trumpeteers to sound and for the Israelites all of them to sound a battle cry, and the walls of Jericho came tumbling down. Joshua commanded the two Israelite spies to keep their promise to Rahab. He told them to go to their house, go to her house, and get her and all of her family. Now, can you see Rahab and her family opening the doors for the Israelite spy? The spies probably reassuring them that they would be safe and that now it was time to go. They indeed were saved. Rahab, her mother, her father, her brothers, and all of the relatives who were with her, safe and sound. They were now placed outside of the Israelite camp, right nearby, but outside. Their lives had been spared because of the faith of one woman. So how do we wait well when we don't feel worthy? First, we have to remember that God's grace is not based on our performance and how good we think we are. We may not have all the answers and we may not always feel worthy of God's love and grace. We may even feel like we're not good enough, that our past mistakes, our failures, and our sins disqualifies us from receiving God's blessing. But the truth is, God's grace is available to all of us, no matter how unworthy we feel. His grace and his compassion is based on his love for us. How do I know this? Because in Lamentations 3, verses 22 to 26, it says, Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for him. The Lord is good to those whose hope is in him, to the one who seeks him. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. The pro this promise reminds us of a second important point to waiting well when you don't feel worthy. It reminds us that we need to trust in God's grace and his plan for our lives. God's grace is sufficient for us and his plan is good. We may not understand what he's doing or why he's allowing us to wait, but we can trust that he knows what is best for us. We can be patient and wait on him because we can trust that his timing is perfect and that he will not leave us or forsake us. We can trust that he will use our weight for our good and for his glory. We can also trust that we can bring all of our pain and all of our fears to him. We can be vulnerable like Rahab and let God know exactly how we are feeling. And when you do that, he will renew your strength and give you the ability to endure the weight. The third important thing that I learned in my waiting is that you need to spend time in his word. You need to learn about his promises and his characters. I searched the scriptures for all the promises like the one in Lamentations, and I wrote them down on little note cards and memorized them and meditated on them. This in itself is a form of worship that honors God and builds your relationship with him. Every time I have a doubt or a fear arise, I recite a scripture so that, so that I can remember who God is and claim his promise to calm my fears. My personal favorite is Isaiah 41.10. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. 
I will strengthen you and help you. I will, will, I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. You see, every time we apply biblical truths to lies and doubts, they die. The fourth important thing to remember is we need to be obedient to God's commands. Waiting doesn't mean doing nothing. Waiting means being faithful in what God has called us to do. Rahab put her faith into action by being obedient and spreading the news about the one true God to her family. She chose to be obedient to God, and we need to be obedient to his word, his will, and his spirit. We need to serve others, love others, and share the gospel with others. We need to show compassion to others as God has shown compassion to us. Finally, we need to have hope. Hope is the confident expectation that God will fulfill his promises. Hope is the assurance that what God has started, he will finish. Hope is the belief that God's plan is better than our plan and that his ways are higher than our ways. We need to hold on to hope even when our waiting seems long and hard. In this story, we see God's love for Rahab, just as she is. We see a woman that knew how to wait well. She waited with faith, believing in God's grace and mercy, even though she likely did not feel worthy. She waited trusting God, remembering all he had done for the Israelites and choosing to believe that he could do the same for her, even though this meant her life was at risk. She waited, for, she waited with obedience, even though she did not understand everything. And she waited with hope, even though she had no guarantee of the outcome. And what was the outcome for Rahab waiting well? When Rahab and her family were rescued, remember, they were placed outside of the Israelite camp. But they did not end up staying there. God brought Rahab and her family to live among the Israelites, and he brought Rahab right into the center of Jesus' family tree. She married an Israelite man and produced a son who was King David's great-grandfather, placing Rahab in the lineage of our Lord Jesus. As we wait for God to move in our lives, we can learn from Rahab's faith. We can do the same, he can do the same for us as he did for Rahab. He can take our waiting and turn it into a story of redemption and grace. He can take our unworthiness and turn it into a testimony of his love and mercy. Now I realized in my waiting that God had to work in me so that he could do the work he needed to do through me. He showed me that he takes our waiting and uses it for a time of growth and transformation. Sometimes God calls us into a waiting period like he did with Rahab because he knows that through our discomfort that his compassion will spread like wildfire. So let us wait well. Let us wait with faith, trust, obedience, and hope. Let us trust in God's grace and his plan for our lives. Let us remember that our worth is in Christ and not in our past mistakes or in our current circumstances. Let us use our waiting as an opportunity to grow in our faith and in our relationship with God. And let us hold on to hope knowing that God is faithful and that he will fulfill his promises. May God bless you as you wait.